Welcome to the first online Kashmir festival presented by Global Kashmiri Pandit Diaspora in association with I Am Buddha, where we have brought a galaxy of thought leaders, scholars, leaders, and celebrities to talk about Kashmir's Pratibha and Yogdan the beacon of light, the cradle of civilization, is how people describe the Kashmir mandala. Today's subject is Kashmir's yoga and tantra, a subject on which it is extremely difficult to find a competent preceptor. But we are very, very fortunate and truly appreciative that eminent Dr. Staneshwar Tamilsana agreed to grace us and give a talk on this all important subject. Let me start with his humble beginnings, which go back to Nepal, the land of his birth. Nepal has been described by many as a place of Tantra. I'll never forget last year when I went to Mount Kailash and first went to Nepal, visiting the famous Pashupati temple and Pashupati Nath temple and other temples. It is an amazing place. Dr. Stimulsana's learning and training in the knowledge of Tantra began in Nepal first with his father and then with other noted Sanskrit scholars. He then went to Banaras, the holy Hindu city of India, to further his studies in Sanskrit. After receiving an MA and becoming an Acharya in classical Indian philosophy, and particularly in yoga and tantra, from the Sampurnanda Sanskrit University in Varanasi in 1991, he returned to Nepal and established the Department of Tantric Studies for an institutional study of Kashmir Shaivism. In 2005, he received his PhD from Martin Luther University in classical Indian philosophy with a focus on Yoga Vasishta and Drishti Shrishti Vada. I was a beneficiary of Professor Timaltsana's course on Yoga Vasishta it is truly a wonder of wonder. Dr. Timulsana is a prolific light writer with five books and over 80 referee journal articles. But besides a scholarship, he's also a sadhaka, a keen seeker, initially trained in Vedas and Kalikrama by his father, Teka Natha. Dr. Timulsana studied Vedanta with Swami Ramananda and Tantric systems with Prema Chaitanya Shamkara, Chaitanya, and Raja Vallabha Veda. He has spent decades learning yoga with eminent sadhaka and siddhas like Kaptar Baba and Sri Pranath Baba. And with this, I'd like to request Professor Timal Sinha to now give us his much awaited talk. <music> Thank you, Rakesh. I'm delighted to participate in the month-long first online Kashmir festival. I'm glad that the role of Kashmir in Tantra, Yoga and Yogi is being highlighted in this memorable event. Sometimes even a rose needs to be admired and even the shining moon needs to be pointed at. Although I am not Kashmiri by birth, I feel Kashmir as my heart for the life I've given to comprehend the philosophical depth of the scholars of Kashmiri origins. We cannot restrict the thoughts of the great sages like Vasugupta, Kallata, Utpala, Abhinavagupta, Kshemaraja, or Jayaratha, just to name a few, 
But we should not separate the land from these great thinkers, as we still need the hills of Kashmir to cultivate saffron while the entire globe enjoys the fragrance. I think there is no place other than Kashmir for the accomplishment of all that we can desire, as it is where in every nook and corner enlightened sages have made their abode and wherein resides Lord Shiva in every step. This indeed is a place for completeness and not just for momentary pleasure. And this is not my eulogy. As Abhinava Gupta says, Sthane sthane muni virakilai chakrire yan nivasa yacca dhyaste pratipadamidam saswayam chandra chudaha tanmanneham samavilasita sesa siddher na siddhai kasmire vyaha puramatha paramatha puram purna vritter na tushtai Kasmir, the very name evokes poetry in me and Maybe many of you feel the same way. But my topic today is not poetry. But I cannot resist it because all the great sages who wrote philosophies and who made tarka, logic or rational thinking, as central to contemplative practices, tarko yoganga muttamam, tarka is the best part of all the limbs of yoga. Even they composed poetry. So rational thinking was never in contrast to poetic expression in Kashmir. And today, when addressing yoga tantra and the yogis, I cannot separate the poetry of the great sages from their analytical philosophy. What is the contribution of Kashmir? For that, I will not expand in different centuries and, and go after too many philosophers because it will be um, too much for my limited time. I will only focus on the contribution of Avinava Gupta, an 11th century polymath who gave philosophy, epistemology, metaphysics, and aesthetics. But we should not jump into a way of thinking, like a prophetic way of thinking, of a quantum leap, and, and discredit the way traditions function in Indian thinking, Indian classical thinking, what we call parampara. So Abhinava Gupta never claims to have thought out something out of blue and, and always considers his writings as commentarial. So I would like to just place my own comments in those perspectives. In terms of yoga, a general imagination for that time and, and that lasted for a long time was those ascetic hermits looking for some caves or forests to go and meditate in isolation and if we read the Kashmiri materials more closely, we get to see that uh, actually these yogis were very much within the world, very much not just writing on aesthetics, writing poetry, writing poetic theories like Rasa and Dhani and Samatkar. They were pretty much in the world, enjoying the world and, and not compromising the highest goal of life of moksha and, and keeping always in sight the, the nirvana or moksha uh, in, in Saivai terminology, samavesha. And on one hand, this uh, yogic re-contemplation, reconfiguration brought a six-fold yoga practice introducing Tarka, a rational inquiry on top of many of the Patanjalian categories, but at the same time it also reintroduced new philosophical paradigm for addressing Tantra, which stereotypically speaking 
goes even further as the practice of the cult of the people living in cremation ground of some agoris or skull bearing kapalikas and and uh, or some uh, orgies in uh, and and or magic and spells and potions and so without a reading the writings of these great thinkers who came from Kashmir, we will not be able to analyze the depth in which those agamas were written. And I would just like to narrow down my focus on key terminology only for how these old structures were remodified, re-evaluated, and at the same time re-energized in, in a broader philosophical paradigm wherein there was everyday dialogue with the Buddhist philosophers, um, uh, those following uh, Dignaga and Dharmakirti and other prominent uh, Vedanta Mimamsa philosophers. And so Kashmiri thinking is very much at the heart of a dialogue and, and very much remains at the heart of dialogue for centuries after or before Abhinava Gupta. So yoga, when we think of yoga and yogis, as I said earlier, we need to reevaluate what constitutes a yogi. And, and a yogi could very much be in the world enjoying worldly pleasures. And the same way when we think of tantra, particularly what comes from the early sources is of the yogini kula, the family of the yoginis the Mahasiddha, the female ascetics. If we go to the roots, historically, to some of the earliest materials in the Kubjika tradition, and uh, of course many of these come far earlier than the development in Kashmir, but when we look through the perspective of Kula, and, and if we follow the interpretation of Abhinava Gupta, then we, we encounter an amazing amalgamation of uh, philosophies in the ritual practices. On one hand, Vedic thinking was going, if we think the Upanishadic way of thinking in Vedanta, a clear-cut rejection of the fusion of karma and jnana, or action and knowledge. And, and uh, on the one hand, that trend is thoroughly rejected in these works, while on the other hand, it reinterpreted some of the most archaic forms of tantric practices and give voice to many of the yogini kula practices that were otherwise abandoned and left in the cremation ground as if. It, emboldened, empowered the divine feminine, gave new philosophy to the worship of Shakti, the mother goddess. At the same time, kept Shiva at the center. So the Yamala practices or the fusion of Shiva and Shakti brought a new interpretation in light of Kashmiri, Abhinava Guptian way of thinking. And what brought to the center of yogic practice in this discourse is the practice nowadays all the yoga studios love to talk about the practice of kundalini and the chakras so because this is not really patanjalian if we think from the classical textual perspective these are found in tantric agamas from early kubjika texts and six chakras or five chakras or many more whatever the chakras numbers are but originally, these were the products of the yogini kula and, and later given deeper philosophical introspection. And, and that is what brought these practices to the common people. And, and every day, people were able to exercise, practice these otherwise um, kept esoteric. And, and very few people were able to practice, maybe living in isolation or in cremation grounds. We can see that tendency of integration rather than dissociation. Even in when Abhinavagupta says, Abhinavagupta describes Fulayaga, for example, 
बाह्ये शक्त यामले चेहे प्राणपथे धीति षोड़ा कुले ज्यासा तद शक्ति संगमा सो नाउ व्हाट वी सी इज बाह्ये शक्त यामले स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम द मोस्ट एक्सटर्नल एस्पेक्ट अफ वर्शिपिंग इमेजेस इन अ प्क्टिस इन सेक्सुअल यूनियन विद पार्टनर और और देहे जस्ट कंटेम्प्लेटिंग अपन वन वन बॉडी प्राण पथे इन द चैनल्स ऑफ द प्राणस एंड द ई इन प्योर इंटेलेक्ट सो व्हेन सिक्स फोल्ड योग एज एज अ कुलयाग इज डिस्क्राइब्ड वी कैन सी ए थोरो कल्टीवेशन of subtle and subtle stages of consciousness starting from the very much external incorporating the body and the bodily expressions and transforming those expressions to deeper pranic flow and actualizing and recognizing their inner vibration in the modes of the mind pure consciousness eventually tracing back to the pristine form of consciousness so what we find in the early text in terms of bhairavi chakra uh, the circle the wheel of bhairavis now gets reinterpreted making many of the practices coming from the bottom rock society like kulalas the potter or um uh, karmara or uh, like uh, people from different occupations to bring them to upwardize to sanskritize and then to generalize so that the practices that were lived at the bottom strata of society were given the same voice given the same dignity and and were practiced by everyday people and so this internalization was not merely an effort to take those practices and inject some of the vedic or upanishadic thinking but it was a continuity what we can find in early texts like the agamas a fourfold aspects of uh, uh, charya kriya uh, jnana yoga so the whatever we find in the earliest structure of the agamic writing it is kept intact so the point here is while we can find tremendous effort in reinterpreting and and redefining all these categories and and giving new voice new breath new light to understand many of the esoteric practices in the writings for example of abhinava gupta these were not an effort to uh, subvert the thrust the ethos of the original text abhinava gupta never claims of himself being a prophet he, he always cites his teachers so, more than 20 of them actually in everything he has to um, uh, state about make a statement about he cites uh, different teachers and and he has equal regard for the teachers of grammar or kula system or his own trika system so this is like he is not just a product of culture he is the culture that generates the ethos of learning from different teachers and and incorporating different ideas traditions to assimilate to infuse and create a civilizational voice that somehow synthesizes multiple streams of thoughts from uh, different agamas and different upanishadic thinking and or or aesthetic philosophies when we read trika or spanda or krama we should never divert our attention from this central argument of fusion of different practices constituting the mandala and and reinvigorating the view of mandalaic philosophy in which the parameters determine the center in which those who are voiceless come to the fore to the center and those who are marginalized become the at the center of the voice of the sacred and they constitute a new mandala new paradigm for giving voice to everybody and 
this is a product of a systematic thinking in a parampara, in a tradition that does not subvert all the original texts but keeps in mind all the teachers who have been teaching and keeping those, those traditions alive and felt and experienced and brought to everyday practice. Why I am repeating the significance of this parampara is in contemporary times we have some stress in, let us say, conservation, like uh, preserving the manuscripts or scanning them. We are focusing not as much on keeping the traditions alive, having the same type of thinking that would fit for 21st century to reinterpret these texts in the context of today's philosophies and today's societies and today's epistemology and, and not let these ideas be colonized the way that uh, aims to um, take these, these classical teachings from the hands of the practitioners, from the hands of those people who are living as tradition, who are the books living, breathing human beings, expressing these practices from generation to generation and simply take them out of their context and constitute a new language, constitute a new ethos, a new philosophy to impose upon those people and to marginalize the very people who brought that philosophy and, and take great of the many ideas from them and make their own businesses out of it, make their own market out of it. So this is the kind of vigilance we need to have about not just conserving in the sense of scanning or even translating the books, but thinking about how these ideas can be revitalized and be lived again and again and have generations of people belonging to culture, claiming the culture and, and, and engaging in the same epistemology and trying to see the world in light of that epistemology. From the Trika perspective, where the divine is expressed in the triadic structure, and the, we find Malini Vijaya as a central text in Abhinava Gupta's works, like uh, he claims so much that Natadastiha uh, Yadnasti Malini Vijaya Tare, he claims in Sri Tantra Loka that there is nothing new in that uh, in his magnum opus that already does not exist in Malini Vijay. Now you can see the humility of a great being that he's not trying to take credit. This is my thinking. It's a completely, that is where you need to keep in sight parampara, the tradition, traditional way of thinking. It's not about being the, being the uh, a brand for ideas. It's about living the ideas. It's not about the individuals. It's about the ideas that we live for. The, the context is from the Trika, the way the idea of Samavesha, for example, um, penetration, entry into the mode of uh, uh, Shiva consciousness or pure consciousness is, is maintained. The whole Tantric system becomes a Upaya Shastra, an instruction for the methods of self-realization. Abhinava Gupta also introduces a category anupaya as a, a upaya means a means which in itself is no means, no means as in itself the means. How can something that is not means can also be means? It's like a, um, when we exaggerate something, it's as if no means, but there is some mechanism still functioning. His justification is very interesting, brilliant actually. He says that the truth Absolute Shiva is self-luminous in nature and like the brilliant sunlight, you do not show a picture or, or, or something, an object to reveal the sunlight. It is on the contrary, the sunlight that reveals everything the same way the truth, the absolute is self-revealing, self-unfolding, self-aware and objects, means do not reveal that. But he also analyzes, of course, borrowing from the Malini Vijaya, 
Shambhava Upaya, Shakta Upaya and Adava Upaya and in this Shambhava Upaya, a Kinchit Chintaka Seva Guruna Pratibodata where there is the concept of Shakti path and I'm not interested in again as I said these colonized ideas of the modern day appropriations of Shakti path but the authentic way of how the very Shiva has this capacity to grace bestow upon one's own self nature. It rests on the foundational philosophy of Swatantra that it is the very freedom embedded within the being consciousness that expresses itself into the manifold and upon its own will that it rediscovers its own universality and singularity and, and re rediscovers oneness within that this is the play of Shiva, dance of Shiva to become the manifold is an expression of very Shiva. So what we find here is like an, if, we, if we engage one or two terminologies, for example, the idea of aham or hridaya or anuttara, the way these concepts are underpinning the entire philosophy, we find that the Trika system not only transcends those days in, in the philosophical context, this is also beyond what we are dealing with today in modern epistemology because this gives a different type of philosophy to address dynamism within the absolute. It, it re, re, reintroduces the idea of tad ejati, tad neijati, tad dure, tad vantike. What we can find in the Strutis, Abhinava Gupta brings that to life and, and then reverberates those concepts which we can find more profoundly addressed in the Krama system. But even just to touch upon aham, for example, I am, how this aham, I am, I consciousness is a fusion of illumination and reflexivity, how this is a fusion of two modes that are described metaphorically as a Shiva and Shakti, and how he sees that in the very corporeal metaphor of himself having this body given in the process of the fusion of his mother and father. So this is very much embodied experience of the divine union of Shiva and Shakti. Vimalakala Sraya Vinava Srishti Maha Janani Bharita Tanuscha Pancha Mukha Gupta Ruchir Janaka and so on. So how Avinava Gupta expresses this aham is already in this embodied philosophy of discovering the absolute within this body, having Bhairava consciousness in which Vishwa Mayata or a total universalization of oneself, finding completeness within while at the same time Vishwa Uttirnata transcending the manifest forms, manifest world and experiencing one's own transcendence in the Anuttara, uh, uh, unsurpassable, the Absolute. This is the Absolute that finds itself in phonetic expression as we can find in this interpretation of Aham as also an acronym for the vowel A to consonant HA, which is acronymically expressing the entire phonemes in Sanskrit. And so just like the expression of Shiva in the cosmic planes refers to manifestation of the categories, 36 in particular, and at the same time it is also an articulation of all the phonemes and, and that parallels the, the, the expression of self-experience. And so while adding 10 new categories to make these 36 categories in the Agamas that started much earlier than the time of Avinava and many Agamas give these categories, but, but the philosophy we find is how the very expression of the undivided consciousness into its being manifold, assuming the manifold is expressed in this articulation, expressed in this 
aham, I am, and how I am the very basic consciousness, the first pulsation of the heart is the expression of being and consciousness. And that is what we find deeply explained in the other category as Hridaya, which Abhinava Gupta gives so many different interpretations. I don't want to go into that now, but we can find that is, is the basis, as a foundational basis for uh, establishing the Kula in the new light, new philosophy. Kula means Satrim Satatvatmakam Jagat. Kula also means the body. Kula also means family. Kula also means collection and of everything. So it is an assimilation of all the categories. It's the totality of all the categories wherein the self discovers itself very much embodied, very much enjoying. And this, this completely uh, reverses the gaze of looking into the world as a miserable pit of uh, 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 a place for suffering and, and which can only bring suffering, disease and death to an amazing expression of aha, the moment of joy, of ecstasy, of orgasm in a very physical sense to every expression of our sensory faculties, every fusion of dictionaries, every fusion of our sense organs with their reciprocal objects as an expression of that very being and consciousness. And this is what we find rediscovered and redefined in the modes of interpretation like in Paratrishika Vivarana, for example. The Krama system is equally deep in the Tantric practice, but it's not just Tantra, it's very much Yoga. Therefore, when we reflect upon these Kashmiri texts, what we find consistently is that the deeper epistemological issues and Yogic practices and Tantric practices become one, and whatever the problems that uh, needed voice for some of these archaic practices like in uh, Kali's Krama will be found in the Trika or Pratyabhijya system and Krama system or the, the succession of the goddesses is one such refined example of how epistemology, visualization and external ritual function side by side and how this provides a platform for us to engage ritual philosophies but beyond that how it becomes its own epistemology. Once again when we go back to lived tradition how these things are practiced at least I'm more familiar with the lived tradition in Nepal and Benares where I got my education. Um, in Nepal we have very much the Krama system alive in the practices, in the rituals, particularly focused on the Guiha Kali tradition and uh, Mangala and uh, uh, various forms of Ugrachanda practices, but particularly in the five Kali or Pancha Kali system. But philosophically, we will get more if we address texts like uh, Sri Tantra Loka for chapter or uh, other materials. So what we find in early texts like Jayadratha Yamala or Kalikulakama Panjashatika and what we can find in Mahakala Samhita and, and what we can learn if we consult the priests in the Kali temples in Nepal or Siddhi Lakshmi temples or many other um, Harasiddha temples in Nepal is a, a, a ritual that is lived and in this living the ritual there is a deeper philosophy that is brought to life, that is lived too. So this is where the fusion of philosophies and, and rituals come in, in tantric practice. Why Krama system is so significant besides the bringing the Kali or giving philosophy for is the otherwise uh, uh, not uh, very many people engage in this uh, form of Kali as a wrathful deity, um, dancing naked in cremation ground, carrying a skull with blood and everything. The layman's imagination of Kali is as if 
uh, some hunting images. And, and without engaging deep Kramo philosophy, we cannot decipher the meaning behind these images. And without engaging the Krama, we cannot even understand the ritual mandalas where the Krama system of Kali is thoroughly observed, like in many of the Nepalese Krama, Krama practices, uh, Sarvam Naya practices. So fundamentally, when we engage the very term Kali, instead of a black goddess, what we find is Kshepo Gyanam Chasanghyanam Gatir Nad Etikramat Kalanam Kurvati Kali Karshinitya Vidiyate. So the very Kali, which is Swatmanha Vedanam Kshepa, so expression of oneself to become the many, like a, to articulate outside. Gyanam, to experience, to feel, to cognize oneself to incorporate within sankhyanam to analyze to locate to determine gati to have the dynamism and and all the terms for gati also refer to consciousness and so to have awareness within so nada to have a simple phonetic expression or the cosmic expression through sound so this is the expression of the foot the expression or splitting articulation of the sound nada brahman so all these things are incorporated within the very interpretation of a single term kali and wherein we get a reconnection with what Bhartriyari said, Nadi Nidhanam Brahma Shabda Tattam Yad Aksharam Vivartate Artha Bhavena Prakriya Jagato Yata and if we read Kashmiri texts, in particular the works of Abhinavagupta, we can see how very much Bhartriyari is alive through the writings of Abhinavagupta and how the analysis of Kala as we can find in the uh, Kala Samudesa of Bhartriyari finds its deeper metaphysics and theology in the works of Abhinavagupta or how the very Brahmakand, the first section in Vakyapadiya of Bhartriyari lives through again and again in the metaphysics of Abhinavagupta, in particularly in the expression of the one and the many, ekameva edamna tam, like where this is the one that assumes the manifold vinam shakti vyapastrayat by means of taking refuge of taking support of shaktis. In the Kama in particular, when we have five successive wheels of srishti generation or creation, sthiti uh, sustenance, samhara reabsorption, anakya in expressive state that we cannot describe in words or images and bhasa, self-illuminating state wherein the, the singular consciousness is already oriented towards its creative dynamic aspect to restart the will of srishti and so on and how the imagery of Kali and how the phonetic expression in terms of mantras associated to Kali are there to describe every single aspect of this cognitive and cosmic phenomena. In the cognitive sense, when Abhinavagupta gives interpretation of 12 Kalis, we can relate to how Prameya Chaitanya or the consciousness that is fully objectified and externalized and Pramatri Chaitanya, the consciousness that is in absolute sense its own ego, constituting internality, is a simple play of the singular consciousness unfolding itself in the 12 structures of Kali, finding Srishti Kali, Stiti Kali, Samara Anakya Bhasa and on Bhadra Kali, Maha Chandogra Bhairava Kali. So all these Kalis get a epistemic structure for understanding deeper role consciousness plays in finding itself as the other, grasping an object, becoming the means of cognition, pramana, and wherein each of these steps have a fourfold substrata, wherein srishti, sthiti, samhara, anakya, or creation, sustenance, reabsorption, and the speechless 
state, uh, reside, and every mode of consciousness, even if it is purely the consciousness of Pramatri or the subject I am, which in itself has the fourfold strata of uh, orientation, creation, origination, and endurance, and so on, is found in the ritual process of visualizing or worshipping Kali. So, the practice of Kali or, or ritual of Kali does not remain in the cremation grounds among the Ati Marga, the transgressive practices, and, and but becomes a subject matter of deeper contemplation, deeper metaphysics. And when we go address like 16 wheels or 17 all the way going, these stages of subtle meditation can go so far that 12 times 1244 subtle stages of meditation, visualization are also found in tantric agamas. This gives new interpretation for every aspect of tantric practice which you can find later in Maheshwarananda, just one example of what this single word mantra is. For example, manana mai riha vihaye riha sankoe bhami tana mai kavaliya visa viyappa anubhui kovi mantra sadhattho. So this is what is mantra. Instead of going to address these are phonemes or these are like spells or these are some sacred sound, this is anubhuti the very pristine experience that has the both, both reflective aspect and expansive aspect and which grants contemplatively speaking liberation and expressively speaking perfection or fulfilling of the desires in the world. It, a deeper soteriology for the refinement of speech and how we can check that through and through that founds the basis for tantric practices, not just Shaiva or Shakta tantric practices, but also Buddhist or Jain or any other forms of tantric practices. So that is, this is why if we read Guya Samaja Tantra, for example, Kayavak Chitta Hridaya Vajra Yoshid Bhageshu Vijahara, when we read the Guya Samaja, even there we find this uh, Kayavak Chitta, the triadic structure of the body, the speech, and the mind. And that type of structure we find in all the tantric practices, but we do not find their deeper meaning, their interpretation, without engaging some of the philosophical texts. And here comes um, a disappointment. A disappointment in the sense that there's so much of focus on studying rituals globally now, or even some interest in conservation. But it, when it comes to engaging these deeper philosophies to address these so-called archaic practices, there is not very much of interest, particularly from among Western scholars who are interested primarily in reading the earliest text or the most archaic forms and separating the way these were lived by these great acharyas and, and how they understood and how they interpreted these texts, what these texts meant to them. And we are bypassing the whole tradition and tracing the earliest text by simply using dictionaries and Paninian grammar and claiming we know better than those people. This is where I feel the threat for a living culture when the whole voices, not of the people today who claim for all kinds of reasons, maybe political, but about the whole generations of pundits living for centuries and millennia to discredit all those experiences and then only to somehow hijack these texts and make it as their own by imposing their voice, marginalizing the voice of the people who have lived these books very much alive, become these books, lived those experiences for millennia. The innovation of Spanda, for example, is, is um, a revolutionary. 
that the, the idea of spanda, pulsation, is not just simply a philosophy of vibration. It's like how the cosmos itself is pulsating and how the being, the absolute, is not uh, uh, um, uh, dramatic, it's, it's always pulsating, it's expressive, it's spontaneous, and it's not niskriya, motionless, passive. And it gives a new philosophy for rethinking our absolute, the absolute categories, and, and re-engaging what it means to live in the modern quantum philosophical world, to live these philosophies if we negate this constant pulsation wherein resides the absolute in its unmesha and nimesha. Yes, you unmesha nimesha abhyam jagataha pralayo dayo tam shakti chakra vivava prabhavam shankaram stuma. That unmesha and nimesha, the very revelation and expression and then closing or opening and closing of the eyes uh, as if finding, rediscovering one's own physicality, universal form, or discovering one's own Shiva nature, and in that sense, closing the eyes from the externalized gaze of materialization. This expression does not just limit here in this category of Unmesha and Nimesha. This goes beyond that. As we can find in the wheels, like a Vyama Vameshwari, this very Kali who is considered Vyama Vameshwari, the, the energies that throw out, that vomit, that articulate, express out in the externalized form of reality, wherein Khechari, that the, the same energy of consciousness dwells in rooms around a pure consciousness, Dikchari in the sensory faculties, Gochari in the mind and, and other inner organs, inner cognitive faculties, and Bhuchari in the externalized forms of expression and, and materialization. So the essence here is ultimately it is the divine singularity that explains the manifold. And this is self-conscious, and this is self-reverberating. This is in its own expression that the manifold is given. And within that manifold, we have all the flavors of life, like some bitter and some spicy heart and some sweet the same way. Even in life, we have all the flavors and sometimes we suffer, sometimes we enjoy. And it is not that therefore life is a trap, but on the contrary, it is that life is a dance. A, the world is a theater. And uh, we are just acting and, and when we recognize our role playing and we recognize our inner being of the absolute, then we are Shiva, we are in that very pristine form, undivided, uninterrupted, even while manifesting very much embodied and very much enjoying the world severing all the sensory objects and being very much in the world at the same time it gives us the sense of the absolute lived within it's only only time when in the body is that the absolute is felt without and also within at the same time it is only when the absolute becomes vishwa utirna and vishwamaya at the same time this is the type of a philosophical platform we need to understand in order to engage the text like Mokshopaya Shastra, for example. Yoga Vasishta is a much uh, later rendition or a uh, continuity of that same Mokshopaya writing, uh, uh, Mokshopaya Shastra, which is uh, again an amalgamation of Advaita Vedanta, of uh, Kashmiri, um, uh, Saivite traditions and philosophies and the yoga system and also Vijnanavada and varied other forms of Buddhist practices. And above all poetry, above all a Mahakavya, a great poetry, epic. So this is, this is how, uh, that, that what touched me after working on Kashmiri Shaivite materials, I was very much intrigued by the discovery of Mokshopaya and then spent my dissertation time reading Yoga Vashishta, which is 
of course, in very easy language compared to other classical texts like uh, of uh, Sri Harsha or uh, Chitsuka Acharya or Madhusudana Saraswati, Yoga Vasishta is in very sweet, simple language, works with narratives and, and weaves poetry to again bring that philosophical essence to the public, to the masses. And these stories are narrated even today, as far as I know, in Nepal and India. People, old generations, many of the illiterate people in villages are very much familiar with the stories of Sudala and stories of Leela and stories of King Lavana. And so they leave the character. So it doesn't matter how much scholarly interpretation they have already. The, it was ingenious to find a way to write some stories by means of which they brought philosophy to everyday masses. The ultimate idea in this spanda, what is always contextual, is the expression of shakti, shakti, shankocha, and vikasa, that an individual is Shiva all, always in all the modes of time. But without recognition of that, one finds one's own finitude limitation. And this sankocha uh, limitation, shrinking, as if, and vikasa expression blossoming, is all that is there in liberation or, or bondage, that in bondage we have shrunken to the condensed form of our own potentials. At the end of the day, the applicability of this philosophy is such that when individuals are struggling, not recognizing their own great potentials, when people feel the world is a negative place and, and depressed and are not able to understand how the life can be pleasant and how they can enjoy the world and, and other people who are pretense yogis, who reject the worldly pleasure in hope that there is some pleasure upon their death, you know. So they are all kind of uh, dispelled and, and uh, the, the idea, the central idea of how the world does not need to be viewed in negative light and how freedom, swatantra, can be the underpinning factor for describing everything, even our limitations, even our own ignorance, even our own disease and suffering. And that is where the Trika system brings, and, and Krama and Spanda bring the highest um, structures of philosophy for our everyday life. Finally, just a word on Pratyavigya, and I'll stop there, a self-recognition, recognizing oneself as divine. Just as the world is very much the very expression of Shiva and liberation in the sense is Shiva recognizing his own being expanded in the form of the manifold, even for us, our own expression becomes the manifold, the world, and our own re recognition, re-understanding of our own pristine nature which is already given there. So this is where Smriti, aspects like a memory, define our freedom that instead of contemplating, considering our history as a trap, this gives force to re-engage our history as the force to give us freedom and, and our history becoming very much a lived history of our body, for example, our genes and our origins. And, and that, that brings us to reclaim our own physicality, reclaim our own condition as a historical being, and very much pratyavigya, to recognize our own presence in the world, to live a meaningful life, to engage with other people, other subjects, and the material world in a dialogic sense of the absolute experiencing and expressing itself. Without engaging the concept such as abhasa or swatantra, the manifestation of itself into the manifold or swatantra, freedom or autonomy, we will miss the point of how very much this is an expression of the same divine that is constituted as the world as well as, as the body. So this is our embodiment, our being in the body, our experiencing pain and pleasure, are given meaning in this, given teleology to self-experience as a play, as an expression, articulation, 
it's just like phonetic articulation. It's just articulation of consciousness of the singular being into the manifold of Shiva experiencing oneself as the world and recognizing oneself as the absolute Shiva. I'm deeply honored to be part of this event. And at the end, I must thank again to the organizers. Thank you, Rakesh. I wish the first online Kashmir festival success and look forward to the next edition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Timotsana. I'm sure the audience is like me, overwhelmed as to how you have woven the fabric over time and space of the great mysteries that were studied in Kashmir Valley. It needs a polymath like you to make visible and it's a tantalizing sight of all that was explored in that wondrous valley. And for this gift that you have given us today, we are truly grateful. Thank you.